much for that. What a day that will be. It's going to be any moment now. No doubt about that. Well, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 3, you have your Bible open there. We're continuing to study the pastoral epistles. We're in the beginning portions in the first letter to Timothy. And uh, we're in chapter 3 now. And we want to think today on the subject of the pastor. The pastor of the church. Paul writes about to Timothy and gives instructions here in chapter number 3. And so let's look at it beginning with verse number 1. We'll read down through verse 7. We'll pray together and see what the Lord has for our teaching, our, our instructions, and our encouragement today. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, uh, he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God once again this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us now to study your word together. And Lord, to study these things. Uh, that you have given us in your word pertaining to the life of the local church. We thank you for uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the instructions, the teachings concerning the, uh, the operation, the organization of the church. And Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to learn and apply these truths to, uh, to our lives. Lord, that, that we would have a church that is truly a biblical church following the teaching, the instruction of the scriptures. And Lord, for that, we'll give you the glory and the thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, we do humbly pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, let me just remind you that in the beginning of our study in 1 Timothy, that chapter 1 was all about the teaching of sound uh, doctrine and the importance of that. Uh, in fact, it's so important that in verse 3 of chapter 1, Paul begins writing to Timothy, and he says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. Now that's where Timothy was serving as the pastor of the local church in Ephesus. Uh, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that, now watch this, that thou mightest uh, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. They teach no other doctrine. The emphasis is on the teaching of sound doctrine. In uh, uh, verse number uh, 10, uh, you'd have to read verse number uh, 9 really to go with it, where it says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any, any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. And he mentions this sound doctrine, the next verse says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And so Paul is teaching Timothy the importance of sound doctrine within the church and the teaching of sound doctrine in the church. That's chapter one. And then chapter number two, he, he gives instruction concerning the biblical role of men and women in the church. But when we come to chapter three, he begins to teach now about the organization of the church. So he's taught about the importance of the teaching of sound doctrine that is needed in the local church. And then there needs to be a good understanding of the biblical role of men and women, equal in salvation, amen, equal in the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet different roles uh, to perform and to carry out different duties within the life of the church. 
But chapter 3 is all about the organization of the church and its leaders and its members. Uh, Paul begins with, with uh, uh, the calling and the qualifications of the pastor from verse 1 down through verse number 7. And then he reviews the requirements for the deacons in the church in verse 8 through verse 13. After that, there's a brief paragraph where he makes note of the church as a whole in verses 14 through 16, or the members of the church. Now understand this about the local church and what the Bible teaches us. It, it, it does teach us that God has imparted certain uh, particular spiritual gifts to believers for ministry within the local church. And according to Ephesians chapter 4, if you'd like to look there, I'll remind you of this. It, 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 the Bible refers to the pastor as a gift to the church, one of the gifts to the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, and beginning with verse 11, where he says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers... And verse 12, for the perfecting, that means for the maturing uh, of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness uh, of Christ. And, and so uh, the pastor, along with the prophets, the apostles at, at the beginning of the church, the evangelists, uh, are all listed as gifts that God has given to the church. Now, what is the purpose of that? Because the church is an organization. And, and as an organization, it has to have leadership. And that's what it's all about. And that's what Paul is teaching Timothy about here. In fact, he said there again in verse 1 of our, of our text for today, this is a true saying. And so in other words, he says, look, th th here's the truth. And, and, and here's something to get a hold of, something to follow. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Understand that in the New Testament, uh, there are three words concerning the leadership of the church that are really synonymous together in, in, in one person. And that is the words bishop, pastor, and elder. Uh, all are synonymous together. The word bishop actually means overseer. And we have scripture that bears that out in 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and beginning with uh, verse number uh, 1, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffer sufferings of Christ and also, of a partake, uh, also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the, and here's the key word, taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And the chief shepherd, when he shall appear, ye shall receive, uh, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a, a crown of glory that fadeth not away. But notice that, that word there, he starts out with the, using the term elders, but then he talks about feeding the flock of God. That would be the, the teaching, the preaching, the spiritual nour nourishment that we need. And, and he says then, taking the oversight thereof. That word there is literally the meaning of the word bishop. The, the definition of bishop is overseer. That's the meaning of, of the word. And so uh, the calling of the overseer or of the bishop, as it's described here, is that to rule in the church according to the Bible in Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews 13 and verse number 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. The Bible gives us that word. Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow consider, considering the end of their conversation. Now, you have to under, the thing is, you just understand the words that, that are here. It talks about the one that has the rule over you that would be of the church. And it says, he's talking about the one who has spoken the word of God to you. 
And so, in other words, the pastor, the preacher, the teacher of the Word of God. And then also, in that same chapter, verse 24, uh, Paul would write in Hebrews 13, verse 24, Salute all of them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, uh, he says, they eventually salute you. So salute them that have the rule. And 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, and, and then watch this now, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. You see, in these verses, it gives us the understanding of, of, the, of how synonymous the words bishop and the words elder and the position of the pastor of the church is. It says the elders that rule well, there's, there's the term for it, the bishop, the overseer, uh, worthy of double honor, especially they, the, uh, they who labor in the word and doctrine. And so we understand that as the pastor teacher as Ephesians chapter 4 uh, describes, as we've already seen. And so that's the bishop, the overseer. And then the elder, uh, the, the word elder does refer to an old man, uh, or maybe it'd be uh, more polite to say an older man anyway, but uh, it does refer to an older man, but it, it's not necessarily age. Not just in age, but the the application here is in spiritual maturity and in experience. The older man of spiritual maturity and experience is the elder. And then the word pastor means shepherd. And as that understanding, it means the one who leads. And so you put all of those together. And as we use the word pastor today, it, is, it has the same uh, duties, the same responsibility as the bishop, the overseer that rules, as the elder, the spiritually mature and experienced man, the shepherd as the one that leads. And so that's the pastor, according to the Bible. And for a man to fill this role, he has to be qualified. And that's what Paul is giving to Timothy here in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. The Bible makes it clear that not just anyone can be a pastor. In fact, you will notice that he actually will list here no, uh, no less than 16 qualifications. And so today's message is going to be quite different than the way you would normally uh, would, uh, uh, would hear me preach. Normally, I like to have an outline. I like to try to alliterate things and, and add applications to it, go to various passages of Scripture in the Bible, make the applications to our lives. But here, we're simply going to be looking at these qualifications one by one. And so that's why I didn't put an outline in your, in your bulletin today because the outline has 16 points. <laughs> 16 points save you from trying to write all that down, but they're right there in the scriptures, right in front of us. And so we're going to really kind of just go through more or less as a Bible study type of preaching here and look at the words, look at the qualifications. And so we begin with verse number two, and that is the qualification of being blameless, being blameless. It says in verse two, a bishop then must be blameless. And the word blameless there quite literally means uh, something like nothing to take hold on. In other words, you, you, can't, you, can't, you, you can't catch the bishop with anything. Uh, there's nothing that you can take hold on him, you know, in, in accusation, you know, uh, and so forth. And so nothing to take hold on, he needs to be blameless. In other words, there must be nothing in his life that's, that either Satan... Or, or the unbeliever can take hold of to criticize or to attack the church with. And uh, that's the importance of it. No man, understand this now, no man, including a pastor, is going to be sinless. We're still in this body of flesh. We still have our struggles. Even the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 said, said he had his problems and, uh, and had his struggles, had his temptations and so forth. So no man uh, is going to be just absolutely uh, uh, sinless, 
Uh, but the thing that it shows us here uh, about the pastor is, to be uh, a qualification of being blameless is, the pastor must always strive to be above reproach. Uh, not to allow himself to have anything that, that, that the devil or, or some, some uh, uh, person outside of the church can get a hold of and, and accuse and, and say and, 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 and hurt the church with it. And so it needs to be blameless as a qualification. Number two, the husband of one wife. Also in verse two, bishop then must be blameless and then the husband of one wife. Now, it's interesting and it's something for us to understand because we're living in such a mixed up society uh, in the world today. And I'm talking about within churches in America today. And it's not just churches of some other denomination. It's in Baptist churches as well. That people don't understand just the literal, un, uh, the literal uh, uh, belief of the word of God. But the husband of one wife, you, you, you can't say it any other way. Uh, the... Um, in fact, when you go through this entire section and what it says about, about the pastor and even what it'll say about the deacons, uh, you'll find out that, in, uh, that all of the adjectives that the Apostle Paul uses, and, and you can see this, especially I understand if you go back and you know the Greek language that, that our New Testament, our King James Bible has been translated from, that all of those adjectives that are listed there describing the pastor or describing uh, the deacons, that they're all written in a masculine form of the Greek language. In, in other words, all of it has to do with uh, masculine. All of it is saying that this is a man. And so the Bible really teaches us very plainly that a woman cannot be a pastor. And that the same requirement is for deacons as well. According to the Bible, a woman is not to be a pastor in the church and a woman is not to be a deacon in the church. And we're really so far away from that understanding in our society today. And some people will say, well, you know, we live in a different time. Things, things have changed. May I just remind us of something together as a, as a church family uh, to, today? Sure, things have changed in society. But this book I hold in my hand has not changed. And it never will change. This word of God will always be the same. And, and the application has got to be the same. You, you can't change the application of it. Especially when it's just so point blank here like this. The husband of one wife. And, and so uh, it applies to, uh, as I said, pastors and deacons. And, 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 and then the emphasis that they want to take. Now, Understand this, and I've taught you this before, but I want to just say it again to go on record. I believe that we should take a literal interpretation of the scriptures. That what we read in our Bible, that God says what he means and he means what he says. You just take it as literal. Now, that does not mean that there is no symbolism. We know there is from our study in such as the prophet Daniel and then in the book of Revelation. But where there is symbolism, the Bible will show you that it is. And, and it doesn't mean that there's not parables or stories in the Bible. Jesus taught in parables. But every time that he did, the Bible said, and, and he spoke a parable, say. You know, so it's, it's not difficult to interpret and, and, and it should not be uh, confused. A literal understanding of the Bible, just believe what it says. And when you've got sections of scripture like this, you just say, uh, you, you should just, but we should just believe what it says. And what it says here for the pastor is the husband of one wife. And I really believe with all my heart that you, the only thing that you can get out of that is it means that the pastor or the deacon as well must not be divorced and remarried. He cannot have two living wives, uh, one wife, of just one wife. Now, there are churches, I know Baptist churches that are trying to get around, around this. There are independent Baptist churches that have changed their standards and have gotten around it. And their idea is to say, well, it simply means one wife at one time. I mean, come on. How do you get that out of just the statement? The husband of one wife. When they do something like that, you know what they're doing? Adding to the word of God. 
you remember what it told us in the book of Revelation? <laughs> so if you add to the word of God, God's going to add the curses in the book of Revelation to you. And so it's a dangerous thing uh, for those that do that. And so the uh, pastor must not be divorced and re remarried. Dedicated Christians, there are dedicated Christians who have been divorced and are remarried. And the Bible, I believe, teaches that they can very well serve in the church and, and have positions in the church, but they cannot be a pastor or deacon. Uh, it disqualifies them from that those two particular offices. That, that's all, all the differences. And so the husband of one wife. Number three, he gives the word vigilant. Uh, the pastor is to be vigilant is the third uh, is the third qualification here also in verse number two. The word vigilant, you could use the word temperate and, and it means using sensible judgments. Of all people, a pastor ought to make common sense. Amen. Would you would you agree with that? He shouldn't be. Uh, he shouldn't. Uh, you shouldn't be easily confused by him. He, sh he shouldn't be. You know, kind of off the wall on some things. A pastor ought to make common sense. Use sensible judgments. Be vigilant. And then number four, it's the word sober. Sober. I trust that. You really want your pastor to be a sober man. Can I hear an amen there? <laughs> you, you'd want that to be sober. Uh, also there in verse number two. And sober, to be sober, means to have a serious attitude. Uh, be earnest in the work. Uh, it, it does not mean that there's no sense of humor. Uh, always solemn and always somber. But it means that the pastor should know the value of things and he does not cheapen his ministry. Hear me carefully. He does not cheapen his ministry by simply trying to be a clown. Amen. We're living in a society where there's a problem with that as well. Uh, try, trying to be a, a clown. I could, boy, I could run a rabbit on that and go a little bit farther, but I'm not going to do it. I, I, I did enjoy something my son told me that he saw a few years ago, and I don't know if it's still out there or not, but somewhere along uh, Interstate 24, there's a, there's a uh, I believe Interstate 24 going into Nashville, Tennessee, that there was, there, there was a billboard sign uh, promoting a church, a particular church in the, in the area, and on their billboard, <laughs> they advertised, they said, our pastor does not wear skinny jeans. <laughs> and uh, I like that. I, I do. Because let's be honest with ourselves. You look at some of these things and there's so much uh, clowning that's going on, so much entertainment that is obviously the, uh, the, the intent. But the Bible uses the word sober here. And then also good behavior in the same verse in verse number two. The pastor should be an orderly man. It's the same Greek word here that is translated. And this is interesting. The word here, order, uh, uh, the, the word here uh, of, of good behavior. Verse two again, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior. The word that is translated by uh, the phrase good behavior is actually the same word that we had uh, last week that, uh, that is translated by the word modest in chapter 10, verse number 9, which is in referring to women's clothing. The same word. And you know, if you think about it like that, that that's a good way to understand it. That the pastor's behavior. And, and when we learned about modest clothing for a woman, you know, we talked about not to the extremes, you know, things like that. Things that things that reveal holiness and godliness, well, the pastor's behavior ought to be that way as well. And so of good behavior. And then also in verse two, given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. And, and uh, an interesting way to understand that, really a literal understanding of the definition of that phrase is loving the stranger. Loving the stranger. Given to hospitality. Being kind to guests being kind to visitors, being kind to people that, that you meet. 
uh, loving the stranger, given to hospitality. And then, of course, in verse number two, the last, the last one listed in that verse is apt to teach. A pastor is to be apt to teach. And in fact, we must understand that, that the teaching of the Word of God, I believe with all of my heart, is one of the main ministries of the pastor. It's really not the critical, you know, critically main uh, ministry of a pastor. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it actually uh, talks about the gifts that God's given to the church, and it lists in there uh, pastor and teacher. Now, an interesting thing that you can see in, in understanding what Paul was saying there is in those other gifts when he talks about the apostles, the prophets, some evangelists, and some, and he says pastor and teachers. That's just a small thing. But if you look back at the verse, you'll notice that between each of the other gifts to the church, there's a comma. So there's one and then there's another. There's another and then there's another. But with pastor and teachers, there's no comma. And, and so to really understand what that, what that has to do is this. It's, it's, uh, that, that it's one and the same. It's, it's like pastor-teacher. And, and so there are other teachers in the church that I believe are gifted at teaching but uh, do not fill the role of the pastor. But I, what I believe is the Bible shows it very plainly that a, ta a pastor, that is one of the things that he has to have is the gift of teaching. He, he, he can't be a pastor really and not be able to teach. That's the main uh, thing there. There has to be a spiritual gift of teaching, and there is a spiritual gift of teaching, according to the Bible. And so the pastor teacher, one person with two functions. And, and, and so it means this, that, that a pastor is automatically a teacher. If a man is going to be a pastor, you should already know that he's a teacher of the Word of God. It's an, it's an automatic thing. Sometimes you might hear someone say that, and sometimes you hear people use the terms, they say, well, they'll say something like, well, our, our pastor's really more of like a, a, a teaching preacher, you know, like there's to be a difference. I don't believe there should be a difference. In fact, I, I've often said like this, I think there ought to be, and, and really what I desire to have, I'll be honest with you, in my own ministry, is that, is that you'll always get some teaching in my preaching and you'll even get a little preaching in my teaching, amen. It, 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 it goes together. And, uh, but the thing about it is, you gotta have it. You can't be just a preacher and not be a teacher. You can't be a pastor and not be a, a teacher. And, and so in uh, 2 Timothy chapter two and verse number two, 2 Timothy chapter two, verse number two. Now remember, Paul is writing to Timothy who is a pastor and he says, in verse 2 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Be able to teach others also. And then in uh, verse number 24 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, And the servant of the Lord... And in the context of this, really, the Apostle Paul would be is speaking about the role of the pastor still. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Apt to teach and patient. And so there's, I really believe, there is a biblical requirement that a pastor is apt to teach. And when you say apt to teach, it means being able to teach. And really, I think the meaning goes even deeper than that. It means to be gifted to teach. It's what, it's what God has given them. Because I found this quote uh, in, in, in my studies, uh, the, a man by the name of Phillips Brooks, which, which, which uh, is, is a well-known preacher back in the 1800s. Some of his writings are still out there, and I like reading uh, some of his writings through the years. But, but Phillips Brooks is quoted as saying this concerning this understanding of apt to teach that apt to teach is not something which comes by accident or by any sudden burst of fiery zeal 
you know, some men just want that uh, recognition or that idea. They thought, well, I can be a preacher or I can be a pastor. And they just, you know, dive into it. But, but then you realize that they really, uh, they really don't have an ability to teach the Word of God. Uh, it's not something that, just, that you just dive into. Uh, it's something that, that God gives you. And, and uh, it's not an overnight thing. A pastor must be a careful and diligent student of the Word of God, as well as other resources, other books, uh, that assist him in teaching and preaching the word of God. Paul would even write to Timothy and, and, and say to, uh, 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 I have to paraphrase it, uh, but, but say, say to, uh, be sure you remember your reading. Uh, give, 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 uh, give time to reading. And, and that's true with uh, the life of a pastor. Uh, you cannot become a pastor also if you don't like to read. And uh, and you don't like to uh, you don't like to study uh, such a man. I believe the Bible he's, he's he's not meeting the qualification to be able to be a pastor, and so he's got to be apt to teach. And then number three is is the, is in uh, or number nine. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, in uh, or number eight in in verse number three is that he's to be not given to wine, not given to wine. Now the word here does refer to that idea of drinking to excess, you know, of, of drinking wine. Now you do have, and some people will try to question our stance against the use of alcoholic beverages and say that, well, Paul told Timothy to use a little wine for his stomach, didn't he? You know, the thing about it is they don't understand. In Bible days, the I believe the wine, the good wine, the best wine was the pure grape juice that was unfermented. And I think that's what Paul was talking about here. Now he's saying that the pastor is not to be given over to the, the fermented wine, you know, to the drinking of, of the liquor. But when he told Timothy, take a little wine for his stomach, he's not talking about the same thing here. Uh, but, and so that's something that I would hope that we would all already understand is a given. You don't want your pastor to be a wino, amen. <laughs> you don't want to be want, you don't want to be given over to wine or or alcoholic beverage of any kind. And so not given to wine. And then also in verse number three it says no striker. Uh, it's not to be a striker. Not given to wine, no striker. And you probably know what that means, but it, it really means to, uh, to uh, not contentious. It means not looking for a fight. You ever known somebody through the years that what just say that they look for a fight, you know? And sometimes someone says, well, I don't look for a fight, but I don't run from it. And that, you know, but uh, a pastor is to be no striker, not contentious. He doesn't look for a fight. He stands for the word of God and he stands as a shepherd and the protector of his church. There are some times when there are wolves in sheep's clothing that make their ways into churches, false teachers. And there are times when, when the pastor uh, does have that responsibility to stand up and to fight for the life of the church. We're not talking about going to blows. We're talking about standing for the word of God and standing for the church. You have, to, you, have to, you have to do that, but no striker. And then also in verse 3, not greedy of filthy lucre. Uh, that, would mean, that means money or material gain. And the Apostle Paul actually says more about money later in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. We'll be getting to that. But this requirement, and, and it's something that, that we may think that, well, I... Uh, I hadn't ever heard of any kind of problem with that, but, but sometimes there are problems with it, with, with pastors, with churches. This, this requirement uh, prohibits a pastor from being one that is always looking for a get-rich scheme and a pyramid thing, and, and, and pastors can fall to things like that. He is not in the ministry for the sake of money. I believe the Bible does teach very plainly that the pastor is to be provided for by the church, by the local church. But the desire of making money is not a good quality 
for the pastor to have. And that's why it's given here in the requirements, not greedy of filthy lucre. And then also in verse number three, it says pastor is to be patient. And the word patient really means to be gentle, to be kind to people and helpful to them. And then another one that kind of goes along with not being a striker, not being contentious and looking for a fight would be not a brawler. It's not to be a brawler. Uh, and for, uh, also there in verse three, pastors must be peacemakers, not troublemakers. But understand this, that does not mean compromising convictions, but you can disagree without being disagreeable. Amen. That, that's what fits there. That should fit with a pastor. And then verse 13, not covetous. Not covetous, or not verse 13, number 13 in your notes, or in, in the notes here, in the list of requirements. Not covetous, also listed in verse number three. And now the thing about it is, we apply that to money especially, but you know, we can all have a problem of, of coveting things besides money. The, uh, the word centers mainly on money, perhaps, but it doesn't have to be just money. And then when you get to verse 4 and verse number 5, another requirement for a pastor is to have a godly family. It says in verse 4 and verse 5, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, I know there are cases, there are situations, and it's sad that sometimes even in a good pastor's home or family, uh, children can rebel. And it's sad, but it does, it does happen. But a requirement for the pastor is that, that, uh, that it shouldn't happen, and that if a man's own children really can't obey and respect him, then, then the church is not likely to, res to respect and obey his leadership neither. And so a qualification is that of a godly family. Another qualification in verse number six is he, he is not to be a novice, not a novice, not a novice, it says. That's being lifted up with pride. He, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Literally, that means if you try to understand the definition of that word novice in the Bible, but, but it means this, one that is newly planted, newly planted. And so in other words, a, a young Christian, a young Christian. Now, age is not a guarantee of maturity. We understand that. But a pastor should be a man that, uh, that gives himself time to study and to grow. Some mature faster than others, but spiritual maturity is the essential. And so sometimes you hear the accounts and, 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 and listen, I'm not saying that it's, that it's all always wrong. I, I think sometimes God just works in a man's life in a special way. But sometimes you hear someone that say that, that will give a testimony that they got saved one week, God called them to preach the next week. And, and they jump right into ministry and in preaching. Well, that, that can be a, a wonderful thing if it is all of God. But it can be a dangerous thing as well. I, I, I'll never forget, but my mentor, when, uh, when I was coming up and first beginning to preach and going to Bible college, my mentor was Dr. Lee J. Hudson, uh, president and founder of Heritage Bible College where I, where I went to school. And uh, he told me, actually when I, when I first felt God calling me to preach, he had told, and I went to see him about going to Bible college. I was working a job, I had a family, worked a full-time job. There, it was just really not possible for me to go off you know, to a college full-time, but this Heritage Bible College was set up to where you met Monday nights. You had, you had Baptist pastors that, that were the professors and the teachers, and, 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 it, and it was wonderful, a wonderful experience. Dr. Lee J. Hudson was a great man of God. He's in heaven now. But I went to see him, and... Uh, when I first surrendered to preach, I, I had known of him. I actually went to high school with his two sons, played football uh, with, his, with, his, with his son. And, uh, but he told me this. He said, the call to preach is the call to prepare. 
And I've said that over and over to young preachers that God has allowed me to uh, maybe try to mentor or try to help uh, through the years. The call to preach is the call to prepare. And, and then he told me another thing. He said, you know, if you're going to be a mechanic, you go to mechanic school. And he just kind of smiled and he didn't have to say anything else. I said, if you're going to be a preacher, you need to go to preacher school, <laughs> go to Bible college. The call to preach is the call to prepare. And so that's what it means by not a novice. Not someone that is very young in the faith and, and just jumps into it. But someone that takes the time to study and to be taught and to seek advice, to seek counsel, to seek help. I think that's a requirement for a pastor. And then the last one in verse number seven He's also to have a good testimony outside the church. Good testimony outside the church. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, that is outside, the unsaved, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. I think you can apply this especially practically to having a good reputation among the people that he does business with. The people we see in the marketplace the people out in the community. Good reputation among the people that he does business with. And those are requirements for the pastor. Now I just say this, I hope that you can see this just by seeing the requirements. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a simple job. It's not an easy thing. But, but, it, but it sure is a, a wonderful blessing. And, and the local church is an organization and as an organi organization it requires a leader it requires oversight and God has given that position of the pastor to, to fulfill those needs of a local church I have heard of churches and seen of churches that didn't believe they had to have a pastor. They would just have different men would take turns preaching. Well, they might enjoy that. They might feel like that that's good for them, but it's not biblical. It's not, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible says churches to have a pastor. And uh, so the church as an organization needs a, needs, a, needs a leader. But let me just say this in closing to remind us of something else. And that is that not only is the church an organization but understand dear friend that the church is a family amen the church is a family it is a united family of of people who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ it is a family that has been brought together uh, by that by that common thread of salvation that only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ gives a family that is, that is together by that, by that common understanding of what it means to be saved and to be a child of God. That's what a church is. It is a family. And, and the question could be asked then, uh, well, that being the case, how do, you, how do you become a part of the family? Well, you become a part of the family of any family, first of all, simply by birth. Amen? You become a part of the family that you were born to. Same thing is true about the church. You become a part of the family by birth. As Jesus said in, to Nicodemus in John chapter number 3, this man that came to Jesus by night and said to him, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. We're talking about a new birth. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, uh, to go to heaven, my friend, you've got to have two births. First of all, you have the physical birth and you're born into 
a human family. And then, but to get into the family of God, there's got to be a second birth, a spiritual birth. You're born physically once. You must then be born spiritually uh, a second time, but also once to have the promise and the gift of eternal life. And so just the picture is, is, is the same there. By physical birth, you're birthed into a family. By spiritual birth, you're birthed into a family, into the family of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then what about someone that might say, yeah, but preacher, um, uh, I don't even know my mother. I, I was given up at birth. And, 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 I, and I don't know that I was birthed. I can say that I was birthed into family because I wasn't. I was given up. But there's good news for you also because the same application is made. You may not have been birthed into family, but, but you, uh, uh, you most likely were adopted into a family. Amen? You were put up for adoption. You were adopted into a family. And, and even if you weren't adopted into a family, if you went to a home for, uh, for, for uh, children with no parents, you, you, that was a family to you. And that same principle of adoption would fit there. Do you know that that is also true about the church, about the family of God? For the Bible tells us over in Romans chapter number 8, Romans chapter 8 and uh, uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 15, Romans chapter 8 and verse number 15. Let me find that for you. And it says there, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs uh, with Christ. You see, the thing about it is, Yes, you must be born again. There's got to be that spiritual birth. That's, that's what it means to be saved. But those that are saved, those that are born again, are also adopted. We are adopted into the family of God. And being members of the family of God, we become sons of God and heirs of God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever think that because you may not have been birthed into a family in this earth that you can't be birthed into the family of God. My friend, you certainly can be birthed into the family of God. And all of us adopted into that family together. In Galatians chapter number 4, Galatians chapter 4, listen to this, verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. That is, we were bound to our sin. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we may receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and of a son, than an heir of God. Through Christ. Do you understand this? This is all about the church. The family of God. Birthed by that second birth. That rebirth. That new birth of the Spirit of God. Adopted, brought into the family of God. Whereby we... We cry and we call God Abba, Father. You know what that word Abba means? It's actually a wonderful word. What it really is in the Bible is we would call it a term of endearment. You know what it means? It means by the, by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that he shed on Calvary's cross. And when by faith we have believed his gospel, confessed his name, trusted in his blood as the payment and providing the forgiveness for our sins, the opportunity to be saved by grace. When we believe that, when we recognize that, that he has made that payment, 
and we trust in him, then of the spirit we are saved, we are born again, and we are actually then adopted and brought into the family of God. That's the church. That's the church. And so you see, it's all about Jesus and what he did on the cross for you and for me. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, church. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed for prayer. Let me just say once again to someone that may be catching this message online, dear friend, if you don't know that you've been born again, if you don't know that you've been adopted, then, then I've got good news for you today. There is a loving Savior who came to this earth at the fullness of the, of the times, Galatians says, it is at the right time. At the right time, at the right place, God made it happen that Jesus came to this earth. And in coming to this earth, he who was the Son of God made flesh on the earth. Yes, he was birthed of the Virgin Mary, but he had no human father. God, the Father, was his father. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit. And as the Son of God, he alone would have precious blood absolutely unstained by the sins of the world. But yet he poured his blood out on the cross when he took upon his body your sins and my sins. And so he's made the way open. He's made the way, he's made the way possible that you can indeed be reborn and be adopted into God's family by faith in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's all you need to do. You need to trust Jesus, trust in him, believe on him, and call upon his name as Romans 10 verse 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll save you today if you just call on his name in faith and believing prayer. And that's our prayer for you at Grace Baptist Church. Let's pray together, church. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the amazing uh, understanding of, of really what the church uh, is. The church is the family of God, bought by the blood of of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, a family that belongs to him, that, that, that forever will belong to him. And the day is coming soon when we will be with him. And so, Lord, we pray for those that uh, don't know you as our Savior, that before the end comes, before the, before the final opportunity, that they would trust you today, trust you and be, and be birthed and adopted into our family, into the family of God. And Lord, for that, we'd be so grateful and give you all the praise and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing together again as Brother Tim leads us. Page 325.